in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is from Thomas Merton, Entering the Silence. Oh God, give peace to your world. Give strength to the hearts of men. Raise us up from death to Christ. Give us to eat his immortality and his glory. Give us to drink the wine of his kingdom. On this, the feast of Corpus Christi, we ask all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So right. good, mor good morning. Good morning, Cup supporters. We have with us today, Timothy O'Donnell. He is a return to our program. And I'm so delighted because you heard him speak all about transgenderism and transhumanism just a little over a month ago now. Today, Timothy is going to focus on the topic of critical race theory and intersectionality, what it is, and the Catholic moral principles to ignite critical thinking as we're faced with this form of indoctrination. Lastly, Tim is going to offer valuable actions for each of us as we are seeing this harmful ideology penetrate really every aspect of our lives. It's in our government, it's in our businesses, and we're seeing it now in our schools uh, affecting our children. Timothy O'Donnell is both a scholar and speaker whose commitment to the pro-life and clauses and religious liberty causes has spanned over two decades. Deeply committed to championing these issues to safeguard the dignity of the human person. He earned a bachelor's degree in Catholic theology from Marion University and completed a master's degree in Catholic life and thought from St. Meinrad School of Theology. Timothy has performed extensive studies and research in cultural, political, economic, and theological disciplines, including postgraduate theological <laughs> studies at the University of Notre Dame. Welcome, Tim. Hey, it's great to be here. And uh, I, I love talking to the Cup supporters and everyone who might be uh, watching this uh, uh, lecture. Uh, you heard already, I'm not alone. That was uh, that bark was Barney the Wonder Dog. So <laughs> I think we're all working remotely. And so uh, I'm oh, alone with Barney. So. Well, welcome, Barney. Welcome, Barney, to the program here. <laughs> he's he's pro-life and Catholic, too, by the way. Just I love it. Like, I love it. <laughs> so I, I'm thrilled to be here. It, it is a really, really important topic. I, I really give you, Vicki, and the Cup organization a lot of credit for uh, bringing up some of these more sensitive, yet very important issues. And I think it's because of their importance, why it's garnered so much attention. Um, and it's, uh, we're, we're going to explore some terms and, and try to get grounded in understanding of, of kind of what we mean by critical race theory and intersectionality and, and, and why it's important to understand what they are and maybe even offer resistance to them. Excellent. Uh, so, so thank you for having me. I'm just excited that you're with us because, you know, we're seeing a lot in the news today on the secular view of this. And people, I'll tell you, I just uh, was at a surprise party and people still do not know what critical race theory is because it's, it's like one friend said, it's like a word salad. They, they use all these different terms, but uh, so it's, I'm really glad you're telling us what it is, but to talk about it from a Catholic perspective is so important. So thank you, Tim. Great. My pleasure. Well, uh, with that, uh, why don't I uh, pull up uh, the presentation? We'll jump right in. Great. Thank you. Okay. I will uh, share my screen. Okay. And get this started here. Okay. Here we go. Uh, so... Uh, again, welcome everyone. Thank you again, uh, Vicki, for this opportunity to just uh, discuss and hopefully with a, a little bit of depth um, about uh, critical race theory and its its companion intersectionality. And I, I, using the, the Latin phrase here or word uh, monotum, um, and monotum um, actually is is a uh, what's well, a Latin word, and it's up to this. So I'm expanding its definition a little bit, or at least its use. Uh, taking a little bit of liberty there, but a, a, a monotum is issued by the CDF, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, um, and it's issued uh, as a warning uh, to a cleric or theologian who uh, they're sensing or, or, or uh, detecting might be about to do something, say, heretical uh, or wrong um, or act against the faith. And so that's why I've named it, because, named uh, this particular lecture monotum on the advisability of critical race theory, because I, I, I'm going to argue for um, a resistance to critical race theory and, and uh, point out the dangers of, of, of intersectionality um, and why they're uh, highly problematic, uh, not only for Catholics, but I would say uh, all people of goodwill will understand why this is uh, this may offer uh, a lot of problems why you might want to offer resistance. Excellent. So I always like to begin with uh, a little sacred scripture or a meaningful quote. Uh, here, I I'm, uh, just got a couple of verses from uh, Psalm 112, Psalm 112 actually was in the daily mass readings recently, and it says, blessed the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commands. 
He shall not fear an ill report. His heart is steadfast, trusting the Lord. And the reason why I, I chose uh, uh, those verses from Psalm 112 is that we are, to, God has given us his divine law, his divine commands. We know those um, as Catholics and Christians that uh, we're to follow the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and the Beatitudes are sort of the supreme revelation of a uh, virtuous and holy life. But we also know that we, when we follow, the closer we follow Christ, the more we imitate Christ, the more we're going to uh, suffer like he suffered and be persecuted. So we have to have courage. Um, we're recording here in, the, in, the, in early June of 2021, and we just celebrated the Feast of Justin Martyr, who is a great example. So we have to be prepared uh, up to martyrdom, whether white martyrdom or red martyrdom. So um, as a professional uh, philosopher and theologian, I like to have definitions. So like you mentioned, Vicki, there can be a lot of kind of word salad going on. So I'm going to um, try to define these terms as they're uh, commonly used or most uh, understood uh, by those proponents of critical race theory and intersectionality uh, so that we uh, are all on the same page. We'll look at Catholic moral principles that, again, as you mentioned, should uh, aid us in um, a critical analysis, but also inform us on how we ought to move forward um, with some active resistance. So I'll lay all that out for us. So let's look at some basic assumptions. Here's a, uh, this, chose this slide because it says racism, racism is engraved in our society. That's one of the prominent features of critical race theory. Uh, it states that, it, uh, critical race states that by those who have developed it and advocate for it, that racism is a property of society, meaning it permeates and saturates um, and even, can, and one, might, one would, might even say contaminates uh, every aspect of society. It's, it's always there. It's the ordinary way of uh, how society operates. And so part of critical race theory, and here some, some viewers may recognize uh, the picture. It's a scene from The Matrix. And of course, the movie The Matrix was predicated on, um, uh, begins with uh, a little bit of spoiler alert, but you, we're, we're, uh, the reality as we know it is a facade. There's a deeper alternate reality that's out there. Now, this quote is a little uh, more political, but the point, uh, the reason why I use this is in critical race theory, one of its tenets, one of its um, basic assumptions, one of its goals is, as I stated before, racism is, 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 has saturated society. It's a social construct. And so the question for the critical race theorist isn't if racism has happened, but how has it happened? It's everywhere. And that until you see that, come to that realization, you're not awake. You, you have to awaken to that reality. And that's, that's where we get the term woke from. You're woke, meaning that you've awakened to the reality that racism is absolutely everywhere and operating at all times. So let's go in a little bit deeper in terms of its uh, operating kind of definition or tenets. And first, as I mentioned, race is a political construction. Uh, by that, I mean, it's a, um, it's a fiction. It's a fiction. It's something that society imposes. Um, it's not intrinsic to the person. It's something that society imposes. So it's a political construction that was invented by white people to give themselves power while excluding all other races from it. And in particular, um, again, reading, um, drawing from critical race theorists themselves, um, and I have a bunch of resources listed at the end of the, the, the books and, and articles, et cetera, that I'm drawing from for this lecture. And it's that uh, these races are primarily focused on, the, on uh, the black community, people who are black and African-American, but, not, but also including pe other people of color, people that we refer to as say brown, for example. Next, racism, and this is key, it's the ordinary state of affairs in society, present in all interactions, all institutions, and phenomena, and effectively permanent in society, short of, and, and here I'm drawing from James Lindsay's work, short of a full social cultural revolution that puts them in charge. So if you get this sense, as we, if, if you may have encountered critical race theory or look into it or, or pay closer attention to it, say in the news, in your community, what, you're, what you may realize is that it's got a radical um, orientation towards revolution because if, if, it, if it's the case as critical race theory or for short CRT proposes that racism saturates and permeates all features of society, institutions, then you have to overturn it. You, they, they do not believe in incremental progress, change, um, uh, uh, re reforming. No, it all has to be toppled and torn down and, and start over. Uh, critical race theory or CRT assumes that racism is present in everything under a doctrine known as, and this is something we've heard a lot, especially over the last few years, systemic racism. And that's what that term means. Systemic racism is, is pointing out that racism 
is simply, uh, it soaks every, every aspect of society in our lives. Uh, CRT, again, critical race theory theorists, begin with the assumption of racism, and then they look to find it. So the assumption is racism is there. Uh, my, our task is the, is to use critical race theory to find it. To, and and it's, it's often hidden in, in, in ways that you may, may, may not uh, expect. An example of that would be if, if you were to assert, Vicki, that uh, someone has, let's say, gotten ahead in, in life. They've achieved, say, some meaningful career goals. They've maybe uh, been able to achieve a, a modest amount of, say, uh, wealth or financial well-being, um, those sorts of things. Well, you'd be wrong. Um, what, that is, what that meritocracy is, is simply masking the racism inherited in the system. The reason why that person actually got ahead is because the institutions and structures of society advantaged or privileged that person to get ahead. So you have to, you have to tear away the meritocracy in order to find the racism. And the racism is either going to, these institutions are either going to advantage or off the, uh, you'll hear the term privilege, privilege some, and then disadvantage, and therefore necessarily disadvantage others. And even if you belong to a group that one might say is um, uh, uh, targeted by racism for di being disadvantaged, you can still have members of that group say advance in society and critical race theorists would say because they're acting white. They, they're they're, they're, they're uh, adopting whiteness as sort of their social convention and that explains how they advance. They also say that everyone who doesn't do this, meaning uh, um, agree with and, and acknowledge uh, critical race theory, the, the truth of it, as they, as they claim, you're then complicit in the problem, including just for disagreeing with critical race theory. So if you don't go along with it, if you don't buy into it, if you don't adhere to it, um, that, that is an expression of your intrinsic racism. So notice how it encapsulates, and I'll talk about this as a critique in a, in a few moments, but notice how that it encapsulates everything. You're either an explicit racist or an implicit racist, but either, which is every, which encorpuses the whole person. So uh, whether you know it or not, you are one. And so yeah. it, it tries to explain, it counts for everything. There's no getting out of it. There's no getting around it. Um, yeah. and, and so I think that's highly problematic from a philosophical reasoning standpoint. Well, and it ex explains a lot to me, maybe, maybe you can help me with this, why they infer every action of yours as some what they call microaggression and that every action of yours is racist in some way. And, and you know, it's hard for me to understand if you say to somebody, your hair looks beautiful today, how that can be inferred as a microaggression because it came from a racist uh, thought. I, you know, it's almost like every, they look to find, to your first point, the assumption is that there's racism and they look to find some kind of uh, racist bent to everything that you say. Yep, you're right. And it's that first bullet point. It's, it's, a, it's absolutely everywhere. Um, that's, that's what CRT, that's what CRT, um, written, that's its claim. So yeah, you might be, you might be, um, you might be taken aback um, if you, in, in the example you just shared, Vicki. And, um, but, but the critical race theory would, might, might say though, the fact that you can't see it is white fragility. That's your white fragility, meaning that you suffer from a kind of um, character defect because you've not internalized your whiteness yet to see how that statement could be racist. And until you do that, you're really part of the problem and you're not woke. So that, that, that's, I think, how we might come to understand it. I'm not saying I agree with that, but I, I'm trying to um, put myself in the shoes of those who, to be fair, to those who are uh, proponents of critical race theory because they, they believe quite sincerely that they're, that they're trying to accomplish something uh, worthwhile and meaningful, which is why there's a lot of energy behind it. Um, they also reject the fundamental uh, liberal, reasonable, legal, and scientific principles upon which liberal societies operate. Again, if, if racism has permeated, um, it soaks, it's contaminated uh, all social institutions, things like um, the impartiality of, say, constitutional law, um, well, th that has to be torn down because, say, for example, the, um, even at, at the time, say, the Constitution was um, uh, written, um, there was slavery present, present in the United States. And therefore, it, uh, the document itself must somehow uh, be defective. And again, not, it, CRT is not a process of incremental change, like through amendments, things like that. It's a, it, has to be, it has to be a complete tearing down and removal of what's gone prior to, to advance. And then this is, which is actually the last bullet point here, which is you have to destroy what is bad. And, but the assumption is, and when you listen to critical race theorists and those who are performing, you don't really hear about what might emerge. The assumption is something better, something beautiful will emerge. Uh, but I think that's a big leap of faith. When you tear something down, it's not, uh, it doesn't follow that something good or better 
uh, necessarily is going to emerge. In fact, when you tear something down, there's probably there's evidence, historical evidence that something worse actually might show up on the scene instead. So what's sort of the, I'll call this sort of the, uh, the, the intellectual framework, conceptual framework uh, operating uh, with uh, critical race theory. It really adopts the oppressor versus oppressed dialectic that's found in uh, Marxism. Marx had borrowed a lot of that from uh, the philosopher Hegel, who had a dialectic of hypothesis, antithesis, colliding in history, and then a new synthesis emerges, and then that cycle repeats, and you have this kind of um, advance, advance, mm -hmm. uh, positive advancement. Marx borrows that framework, changes it, and for Marx, Karl Marx, he's going to have the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat. Now what we've seen in our current contemporary setting, the same uh, oppressor versus oppressed framework, but now you have white supremacy op as oppressors um, uh, oppressing especially people of color, but particularly black people. Um, and again, as I mentioned, this is a Marxist dialectic. The terms have been uh, um, replaced. Uh, and I would say maybe consider, consider that as a kind of updating, if you will. And then you graft onto this framework um, identity politics into this. Identity politics has us look at, at human beings in terms of groups that we belong to. So that's a critical move from an individual, seen as an individual person, to the, a group or groups that we belong to. So it deals with humanity on a collectivist basis. It calls out white and whiteness as a category and then builds different features underneath those categories. Black and blackness, again, that's gonna be terminology used for the oppressed. These are people of color who, uh, again, kind of replace the Marxist framework of bourgeoisie versus proletariat. We reduce people to the racial essence foregoing individuals for the collective identity or group. This is going to be uh, such an important um, move that CRT as a theory makes because when you deal with uh, people as in terms of groups, this collectivist mindset, what happens is it washes out individual merit or individual guilt and then allows you to assign merit or guilt to entire groups or even classes of people. So this is how you can then say all uh, white people belong to a certain category of guilt that are advancing, as CRT would, would uh, claim, advancing racism and institutionalized racism, whether they know it or not. So, so you're guilty of it and, and I'm guilty of it, regardless of our individual uh, actions or choices or individual character, we're, we're caught up into it. Um, we, it then denounces people, again, based on race. This is why one of the criticisms of critical race theory is that it is itself racist because it really treats people by race, which it claims to be a social construction anyway. Um, and so it, it's going to need to demolish law and order. Let me give you an example. This is why, um, let's say there's an example, and there's, there's plenty to be drawn from. Let's say there's an example of uh, police brutality. It's, it's horrible when it happens. I don't think it's emblematic at all of uh, the, the really great work that our, our uh, law enforcement uh, men and women do day in and day out to, to keep us safe and protect us and enforce the laws. But there are times that a, a, law, uh, a member of law enforcement will do something horrendous, will do something criminal and hurt or kill someone. And then they should be held account. But for critical race theory, it's not enough for that officer to be held account uh, for their horrendous criminal -like actions. It points to that the whole system of law and order is, that's an example that points to the broader system of racism. And therefore, this is why you have movements like defund the police. You're like, well, why would people want to defund the police? Well, if you have come to under, if you've sort of bought in with it, bought into critical race theory, you're going to, you're going to recognize that racism uh, permeates and soaks the law enforcement community, law enforcement institutions, and therefore has to be yeah, you defund it because that's a way of sort of choking it off and getting rid of it so that you can replace it with something else. Well, to your point earlier, you said, and they think that something will emerge that's more beautiful. Well, look what happened in Minneapolis with their, you know, revisions and their slashing of the police force and their backing of the, the Black Lives Matter initiative and, and trying to defund the police. We've, they're having rampant crime there and now they're begging the police to come back. And so, you know, be careful what we ask for. Yeah, there's, there's real world consequences to these decisions. And that, that's why looking at critical race theory and understanding it is so important because I, you know, we, we've heard elections have consequences. So I, I, would, I would, as a philosopher, say ideas have consequences. Things begin with our ideas and then our ideas form our actions and what we're going to do. And then, and then as we implement these ideas, real consequences, good and bad, uh, flow from them. 
what are some of the goals? Well, some of the goals of CRT, critical race theory, are uh, it's a theory of negation. And here again, I want to mention James Lindsay. Um, he's done phenomenal work. I've read a lot of his articles. He's also put a book out. And again, I have these resources at the end, a book he co-authored with Helen Pluckrose called Cynical Theories, which I highly recommend because CRT isn't, uh, is really a subcategory of critical theory. Critical theory having emerged in law schools um, over 20 years ago and under which it has subcategories, uh, critical race theory being a subcategory of critical theory, but there's other theories like queer theory, et cetera. There's a bunch of, um, and that's all outlined in that book. Highly recommend it. But it's a theory of negations. It's, it's, it's again, it's a theory in which it assumes um, that racism is everywhere. And what we need to do is find it, expose it, and then disrupt it. So in order to disrupt it, again, you have to kind of tear things down. That's this theory of negation. You deconstruct social institutions. Again, because the social institutions are perpetuating the racism, they have to be deconstructed. They have to be torn down. You have to point out how social institutions, including the traditional family, are coded. What's going on here? Well, you may feel that, uh, you may feel or sense that traditional families have come under a barrage of attacks from a variety of different angles. And I think that's true. And in fact, you just recently, Vicki Cup just recently hosted a wonderful uh, lecture on the importance of mom and dads. So what's going on here? Well, the traditional family is the setting. By that, I mean you have a, um, a mother and a father who have children and then are in a, in a uh, permanent relationship, a covenantal relationship with each other and raising their offspring, raising their children. That's what I mean by traditional family. It's that setting by which values and even the Holy Catholic faith preeminently is transmitted from one generation to the next. It begins, that's the building block of society. So in critical race theory, What's happening? Well, we all are what you have oppressors and the oppressed. You have then in the traditional family setting, the transmission of racism from one generation to the next. This is one way in which racism is being perpetuated forward. And it's done in ways that are explicit and implicit because the system, meaning society and its institutions are organized in such a way to, again, privilege or advantage some at the expense of oppressing and harming others. Therefore, the traditional, to disrupt that, this transmission across generations, one has to move away from or destroy the traditional family setting so that racism cannot, can no longer be transmitted. This is why uh, it had, um, had, it's been up, it's been changed, been removed. But if you were to have gone to, because I did, many, many had gone to the Black Lives Matter organization's website a year ago, you would have seen that one of their goals was to destroy the uh, uh, traditional or nuclear family sometimes it's referred to. And this is one of the reasons why, because it's a source of propagating harm, as they would see it. So yeah, you I'm, glad, mm -hmm, I'm glad you're bringing this up because, you know, I'm, I've become immersed in this fight at this local level. And what we're seeing is that the social emotional learning is a gateway to the critical race theory tenets. And what we're seeing in the local schools is that they're going around the nuclear family, the family, in notifying the family of surveys that the children are taking on matters of uh, politics, abortion, uh, gender ideology, racism, and they're going around them. If the kids have a, an emotional day, they're instructed not to tell the parents that they went into a safe space during the day. I mean, these are all facets of critical race theory because to your point, Timothy, they're trying to upend and, and, and basically de facto go around and exclude the nuclear family from being the relevant source of values for that child. So it's, it's diabolical. Well, sure, sure. I'm glad you brought up those examples, Vicki, because it's a, it points out that, yeah. So again, once, once you, once you have some of these assumptions of critical race theory, or, or it sounds even more broader, really what you're encountering, really just critical theory and some of its other tenants. And I, and it, and you're right that you, that the parents, are untrustworthy because the parents, um, they're untrustworthy and ought not to be left alone to educate and form their children. Because again, this is a way in which uh, racism and other discrimination, discriminatory attitudes are transmitted one to the other. So uh, institutions like our educational institutions, some will who have bought into critical theory, critical race theory, yeah, uh, need to see themselves as needing to what? The word they use is disrupt. You have to disrupt what the parents are doing with the children, because that is, in a certain sense, the parents are harming their children. 
right. by, by training them to be a racist or a homophobe or a transphobe or all of these really, uh, all these pejoratives that are designed to shame, marginalize, um, and uh, silence um, and create complicity with their project. This is why, it, so this is why these words, it obliterates the dominance of racial discrimination and violence intrinsic to this nation. That's what they're after. So, um, and in order to do that, you really have to, you really have to destroy the underpinnings of our society. When you, when you, when you have an effort, for example, in Oregon, um, and it's, and it's spreading where you, um, your, your, your school administration and others are adopting a curricula that, that, um, uh, purports that mathematics is somehow racist and that basic arithmetic, the, the, the normal operating, uh, proven uh, method of uh, basic arithmetic, addition, subtraction, for example, are no longer true because no longer hold because they are uh, they they are that is that methodology that science that discipline is soaked with white supremacy and whiteness. So one ought not to teachers are being told and instructed that you ought not to um, be limited limit your answer that two plus two equals four. If a if a student puts down an answer other than four, well you know you have to go on. That's not necessarily wrong. Um, you have to try to understand where that student is coming from and what their what their racial experience might be that has led them to that. And you ought not to be locked into something uh, that uh, as uh, that suffers from whiteness and whiteness. Uh, one of its features is rationality. So you wouldn't want to lock uh, yourself into something like two plus two always equals four. So what? So, what I mean, think of the implications. I mean, how how in the world if a student can't be instructed on basic math, basic arithmetic correctly, it, it, which is an objective discipline? then how are they to make their way in the world? You yeah. certainly aren't going to produce uh, a lot of engineers. You wouldn't want an engineer uh, building your bridge if they're not committed to the basic tenets of arithmetic. Because guess what? That bridge probably isn't going to be safe. Okay, it's not well, going to be a good bridge. I'm being yeah, a little yeah. tongue-in-cheek here. But I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit alarming, the, the implications of this. Or another school that had, that had found, you know, honors mathematics in high school to be racist. Why? Because uh, when, you, when you survey the racial demographics, uh, in this particular school system of who's in these advanced math classes, it was um, disproportionately white. And so the reading by critical race theory is because it's disproportionately white, the cause is systemic racism. So to eliminate systemic racism, what did they do? They eliminated the honors math program for students. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's something else, really. Yeah, we have this uh, guy in, in the Unified Carmel Group, Alvin Louie, who came from California and he said where this is more advanced, uh, what it has caused their school systems throughout all California to do is to uh, get rid of all programs for what he calls the high flyers. And it has uh, resulted in those that uh, live in the media mediocrity zone to, uh, to, to basically crater in their grades because they're grading with equity now to your point Two plus two doesn't have to equal four if you have a different uh, life experience because you're black, then you can not have that marked wrong. And then he said, and that the people that are that are were already at the bottom before, they almost drop out completely because there's there's no help for them. And that's why he picked up and moved here in hopes that he might find something different, only to find out it's the wave has been moving from the west here, you know, to the east. Yeah, that's. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I hadn't. I hadn't heard that particular example, but it does speak to what some of these problems really are—the real problems that are emerging. This this kind of brings us to the point of resistance. So, if you if one were to again kind of examine CRT, critical race theory, and find find some or or all of it objectionable, for good reasons, uh, you might you would resist it. You'd resist it for yourself, for others, people care for children, etc. But opposition to CRT. According to CRT, that's the proof of your whiteness, your white fragility, um, your intrinsic white superiority. So again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a theory that encompasses absolutely everything. There's no getting around it. There's no which, which I'm going to say is, um, in terms of a, a, a critique of it, is that if it's a, if a theory explains absolutely everything, if it's not falsifiable, then it's then it's really a, it's a, it's from a philosophical and I would say even scientific reasoning standpoint, it's no, it's no theory at all. I mean, if it, if it explains everything that's not falsifiable, then it really is, it really doesn't, it actually doesn't work. Um, and how to be rejected. That's a, just kind of a common sense uh, argument. 
Um, it also employs a social shaming. So if you speak out against uh, CRT, you are likely to draw a uh, social shaming to yourself, social castigation. If you resist, you'll be ostracized, you may lose your job, um, your position, opportunities of advancement, things like that. Um, organizations uh, adopt as a way to manage brand risk and insulate themselves from social penalties. This is why you'll see, uh, for example, different agencies or different um, uh, corporations, businesses, what have you, they're going to engage in the kind of virtue signaling uh, in order to protect themselves from the points that were just made earlier. They don't want to be, they don't want to suffer uh, brand damage by attacks through social media for, for by being, um, you know, uh, receiving uh, accusations of racism, et cetera. Um, and this also then protects or insulates them, their future prospects. So there's a lot of people, I think, Vicki, that you and I have talked to that are, are, have legitimate, reasonable concerns about critical race theory, say, entering into the, the school system, indoctrinating children, and but are terrified to speak up. They're terrified to say anything because of the perceived ramifications, which there's a lot of, there's a lot of evidence that you really risk um, uh, uh, being attacked for opposing it. And again, just by virtue of opposing it, critical race theorists and their proponents, that's an example of your own, uh, your own uh, racism anyway. It's a dangerous ideology because um, and uh, the reason stated, but let's remember that when we empower ide ideologies, um, that really this is really going to divide people and has been dividing people quite a bit because it's based, it's dividing us into, uh, by using um, identity politics, it's kept throwing us into groups. Um, we've seen this happen in the past. Um, when you begin to use, pit one group against another um, throughout history, there's uh, it's commonplace that that erupts in violence, uh, even genocide. So you can, uh, students of history, re recent history can look at like a Rwanda genocide where you have the Hutu and the Tutsis and they are pitted against each other and it results in, in an absolute uh, massacre of the Tutsis by the Hutus. But it's, it's, it began with though, how do you get to the point where you have um, a, a large swath of the population running around with machetes hacking their friends and neighbors to death? Well, there's a trail of dehumanization um, and ascribing guilt to a, a group or class of people that leads up to it. Now let's move the conversation just a little bit into something that is related to critical race theory. And it's a term that, um, we, if you're familiar with critical race theory, uh, you, you, you may or may not be really in, uh, heard of intersectionality, but it's, it's a very important uh, term um, and you'll see why. So intersectionality um, provides a theoretical framework through which plaintiffs, so this begins in the court system, critical theory itself, as I mentioned before, began in law schools. Um, so this is a uh, framework by which plaintiffs can seek remedies for multiple forms, that's the key, multiple forms of discrimination instead of being forced to distill their discrimination into one singular claim. This is why I use this picture here of a busy intersection because the claim of intersectionality goes something like this. Um, I, I'll use myself as an example. I have a uh, certain, uh, I, let's say I think I've, I've been discriminated against. I might currently say I was discri discriminated against, say by an employer, and maybe in my, my uh, view of things, it was because of my age. That's one category, because I'm over 40. That's a protected class. It might be because of my religious beliefs. That's a, that's a protected uh, category. It might be because of my sex. I'm male. So um, it could be because of my sexual orientation. It could be, so there's, we belong, we all belong to various different categories. Under the current law, up until very, very recently, if I were discriminated against, I would have to make a claim one category at a time. I would have to, I would have to prove that I was discriminated against based on my age. I'd have to prove that I was discriminated against because of, say, my race. I'd have to prove that I was discriminated against because of my religious beliefs, each separately. Intersectionality it claims that, well, no, what, uh, you're a whole person that belongs to all these groups, and if I'm discriminated against, discriminated against in one category, say age, it automatically includes all the other categories that I uh, that are part of who I am. That, that part of, and so this has uh, very very deep um, ramifications that are just starting to emerge. Intersectionality uh, again, continuing with this definition, and here I'm, I'm drawing from uh, James Lindsay and others um, because the intersectional experience is greater than the sum of, say, racism and sexism. In this example, imagine um, a um, over 40 um, black female in the workplace. And there's an actual example. 
uh, here of a case that, that we'll look at here shortly. So because the intersectionality experience is greater than the sum of racism and sexism, so she's discriminated against, intersectionality says it's not about, it's not, it may, it's not only because, say, she's discriminated because she's black, but it's also because of she's female. And that these are not additive. It's not like one category plus another category. No, it's an exponential harm that's being done when this person's being discriminated against. So that's why they're saying it's, it's greater than the sum of racism and sexism. Any analysis that does not take intersectionality into account cannot sufficiently address the particular manner in which, say, black women are subordinated. In the individual black woman, her race and gender are, here's the key, inextricably linked. They're inseparable. And this uh, dictates her experience and social location. So intersectionality will, has uh, identified that black women are really at the very bottom of the, uh, that they're located at the very bottom of the social, uh, social structure of society. Um, and their experience is not just a, uh, not simply, their experience of discrimination is not simply a uh, one plus one equals two, but it's, it's far worse than that. Here's, here's how this has made its way through the court system. So last year in summer 2020, June, we're recording this in June, having this conversation in June, uh, that's usually when you get Supreme Court decisions. And this is what happened last year. Neil, Justice Neil Gorsuch wrote the majority opinion, finding in favor of Bostock. It was Bostock versus Clayton County. I highly, highly recommend. I know this sounds a little geeky, but read, read both the majority opinion. And then there, it was a six to three decision. And it was uh, Justice Alito uh, writing the dissent. And it's uh, joined by Justice Scalia. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh also dissented, but wrote his own dissent. But you've got to read Justice Alito, both the majority opinion, but then Justice Alito's critique. And I'll explain why this particular decision was very, very uh, problematic. And it's foreboding of things to come. Well, Justice Neil Gorsuch delivered the opinion, uh, again, 6-3 uh, vote uh, on the decision. And it holds that Title VII, which is part of the Civil Rights Act, uh, protections do extend to sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, Gorsuch purported to apply a straightforward textualist reading of the statute. Now, why this is important is when Title VII was written over 40 years ago, it created protections based on sex, sex understood and written out in the, in the law as male and female. Bostock extends that definition to include, as it says here, sexual orientation and gender identity. Now, if you go, if you think back 40 plus years ago, we didn't have gender identity. It, it, there wasn't a term that was even being, I don't even think it was created yet. And so it wasn't even being used. So, so it could not have, and this is a legal, it could not have been in the original intent of the law. And if you're doing a textualist interpretation, that's what you're supposed to be doing. And so this is highly problematic because it's a kind of reading into, and this is an example of what? Intersectionality. Because what it's saying is when someone is discriminated against for one category, all these other categories are automatically included that the person belongs to. So Justice Alito, Alito Thomas and Kavanaugh, as I mentioned, dissented, but it was in the intersectionality and sexual orientation or gender identity that was central. In other words, my set, the intersection is sexual orientation, gender identity are inextricably linked to my sex as male or female. So when in Bostock's claim that they were discriminated against based on sexual orientation, it's automatically included in male and female written in Title VII. That's the, that's the precarious move, the dangerous move that was made. What are the implications of that? Well, single access, which is what I was describing before, that's the term that says you need to prove that you were discriminated against category by category by category, by whether it was race, uh, your sex, your age, religious beliefs, the protected classes that are outlined in the law. Um, now, uh, the single access thinking now, especially in discrimination cases of law, for, as I mentioned, a woman and her intersexual uh, and her intersection of two forms of discrimination should be a woman and she might be um, uh, a lesbian, should be a woman and over 40, um, you are automatically linked. So when you again, discriminate in one category, the others are now included. There's multiple burden, not discrete sources of discrimination. So you don't have to, you ought not to um, try to, uh, we need to abandon the approach of um, uh, filing claims based on individual categories, but rather it's all included. Um, you don't wanna bisect or uh, disaggregate identity. Again, terms that are being used or intersectionality in the law, hegemonic ideology and hegemonic oppression. Right, so in this case, what it means with intersectionality as it's working its way through the legal system with in, in light of in the aftermath of the Bostock decision, um, it has wide reaching um, implications for things like religious freedom, for example, religious liberty, and I'll get to that. 
it also purports that there's a kind of fragment itself because you, you force the person to, to, to pick out all the different groups that they belong to. And then a new term, this came out of some of my research, Jane Crow laws. So we've heard of Jim Crow laws about uh, in the South, op oppressing, segregating uh, people of color, especially blacks. But now you have what is referred to as Jane Crow laws. These are laws that, that are held to be, purported to be used as discriminatory against um, people uh, based on uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, um, this, this, these are themes that you and I had a chance to discuss in some depth um, on the previous lecture on transgenderism, transhumanism. So let's move here into some uh, Catholic moral principles. We'll talk about some action steps and, and, and uh, kind of uh, try to wrap, the, wrap things up here a little bit. The Catholic moral principles that I believe are at work here that we should be uh, um, um, in touch with and then applying, one would be nat the natural moral law. That's a, uh, uh, here's a picture of uh, one of my one of my favorite saints when he was both for his, uh, his great wisdom, but also his, uh, his holiness, his virtue, St. Thomas Aquinas. So critical race theory and intersectionality, I would say, I, I purport, uh, I argue that violates the natural moral law. Why does it do that? Well, natural moral law has several precepts to it, but the, but the, the two that come to mind for me are, one is it violates uh, the first principle precept, which is do good and avoid evil. I think critical race theory does a lot of harm. Um, because it, it teaches uh, people, and especially when it's taught to children, that in children we have a special responsibility and, and obligation to, um, to treat other people based on their race. And that washes away or eliminates a Catholic understanding of the human person as made in the image and likeness of God, and that each person has their own soul. Each of us are going to face um, uh, death, judgment, heaven, or hell based on our merits, based on our sin. Um, and this pushes, CRT pushes us into a group category and treats us uh, collectively. Another thing, another uh, precept of natural moral law that it violates um, is uh, it understands um, uh, human beings to uh, uh, live in society. So that feeds into this next, the common good. It's going to undermine the common good because we're no longer going to be able to pursue, it's going to make it highly difficult, I will say very difficult, to pursue the common good together because we don't share a vision of the common good as uh, with uh, as a, 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 a CRT versus, say, a Catholic understanding of the common good. The equality and dignity of the person also is something that the Catholic Church is a great defender of and upholds. You can really see that uh, come to life in Theology of the Body by St. John Paul II. And then lastly, when you, when you um, look into, listen to proponents, advocates of critical race theory, CRT, you will not hear um, them bring up uh, God. It, it kind of has an embedded atheistic framework to it, but also it does not bring up sin, falsity, or error. And we would hold that that uh, human beings were wounded by original sin. We need a savior, we need redemption, and we need forgiveness. There is no such framework within critical race theory to be white is a kind of original sin. And there is no getting out of being white. <laughs> you know, the best you can hope to do is to, to become an, uh, an ally uh, uh, fighting against this institutional race. That's the best you can hope for, but you're never gonna escape, uh, escape your guilt. A really interesting question that was brought up by uh, Professor uh, Joshua Mitchell, who I really admire, um, and uh, in his book uh, *America Awakening*, says, "Well, okay, think about think about the talk about uh, say making reparations um, by by some to others who are descendants of slavery." And his question is is kind of a rhetorical one, but I think it makes a good point. Which is like, well, how much do I owe? Like, like how what do I, how much? I mean, if, if I write a check, like what size? And then does that absolve me at that point if I do write a check? I mean, so there's real practical problems with, with CRT and, and, and working out it, its implications. Yeah, and I, I'm so glad you're bringing this up in, in the concept that the original sin is racism because that flies in the face of Christianity, Catholicism, you know, and, and, you know, and what, what troubles me, what troubles me with all of this, and, and I'm sure you're going to talk about how divisive this is, and, and God wants his people to come together you know, you know, he wants truth first. Okay. And, and sometimes truth does divide, but he, he wants us to try to achieve unity and, and you can't do that with a critical race theory because it is a pitting it's pitting the oppressor against the oppressed. So it's by its design, it is, it is trying to divide people. Right. And you, you can't, it's, it, you cannot escape the category of which you're in. No, it, uh... no, no, you can't. Um, great article by uh, Dr. Uh, Denise Donahue recently in uh, 
Catholic World Report. It's called Why is uh, I abbreviate here for the, for the slide. Critical Race Theory is Contrary to Catholic Social Education. Again, I encourage readers, uh, listeners to, to go ahead and uh, access that. You can get it online for free. And she says, the restoration of a proper order of equality and dignity of persons cannot indiscriminately target people based on the power they hold, the wealth they possess, their race, their nationality, or place of birth, their religion, their family relationship, or friendship. But critical race theory violates all that because it, it throws, um, it, 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 it's committed to this framework of racism is everywhere. It's the normal way things operate. Um, we just have to discover how it's happening. And so you can't move out of, you're not going to move out of your, if you're in the oppressor category, you're not going to be able to move out of that if you're being oppressed. There's nothing you can really do to, to, to move out of that category either. Here are some of, the, uh, some of the problems with CRT, I would say, from a Catholic perspective, um, as I read it. Uh, again, it's godless. There's, there's no reference to God or uh, any, any type of divine providence or providential plan, eternal beatitude, that we're made in the image and likeness of God for a, a purpose. Um, which is to know God, to love God, to serve him in this life, so you can be with him uh, forever in heaven, right out of the Baltimore Catechism. I think that's a truth. There's no mechanism of forgiveness, right? And you see that if you oppose CRT, you, you again, you can't move out of the oppressor category. You and I can't move out of the oppressor category. And then there's no forgiveness. There's no way to, if you engage in something, uh, violate a tenant of CRT, you could uh, certainly experience attacks and there's no way you can atone for it. And this is this gives rise, which could be a whole nother, uh, and probably should be a whole nother discussion around cancel culture. That's the scapegoating mechanism at work there, as Rene Girard talks about it, I think. Um, you, this framework of oppressor and oppressed really is kind of, the oppressed are really pure and the oppressor are impure. This is Joshua Mitchell's framework. Um, there's no atonement. There's nothing you can do to, to, to make up for it or redeem yourself. There is no savior. There is no redeemer. Identity politics really, in a sense, is a kind of haunting of, I think Ross Duthat of the uh, New York Times, a, a good Catholic saw him talk. Uh, not that long ago, Benedictine uh, College. And he said, he's got a book called Bad Religion and talks about, he also has one called Decadent Society, recommends both books. But there is this kind of, and same with Joshua Mitchell, there is this kind of movement where you can see within this critical race theory kind of a shadow, shadowy elements of Christian terms like original sin, but the original sin is what? As you mentioned, it's racism for America. This is, the, this is I think, one part of the genesis behind the 1619 project that's been discriminated uh, discredited uh, in large part to try to shift the founding from founding event from say the Declaration of Independence 1776 to 1619 when um, enslaved Africans were brought to Virginia a horrendous uh, uh, happening historical happening to be sure and condemnable but I don't think it really translates to the founding of the country per se it's also problematic and there's one of our heroes right the the great uh saint john paul ii this is when he was uh before he became the holy pontiff and i i like this picture because he sort of contemplates. it looks like he's contemplating like what's going on and there, there, what a, what a great champion of the holy catholic faith human dignity uh religious liberty and freedom of uh, human flourishing as he fought so valiantly uh and, and helped bring about the defeat of communism in uh eastern europe as I mentioned before, critical race theory, though, is simply a bad argument because there's no getting around it. It's not falsifiable. If it explains everything, it literally explains nothing. And that's a, just a common sense philosophical critique. Um, it vacates personal responsibility because it, it holds that merit, meritocracy, is a product of the, race, the racist system. So if you're doing something that society sees as good, you're, you're um, experiencing white privilege, whether you're white or not. If you're not white, if you're a person of color, and you're, um, what you're doing is considered meritorious, it's because you're acting white or um, exhibiting uh, things that the white supremacist system approves of. Yeah, this and is if you probably, don't see that, you're willfully blind to it. That, yeah, that's, that's I'm, glad you, I'm sorry to interrupt, Tim, but sure. I'm so glad you're bringing this up because the lack of accountability, how can we do a, a, an examination of conscience for our own specific actions? And where does virtues come in for our own lives. You know, everything is about collective guilt or collective virtue for depending upon the color of our skin or the grouping, whether you're LGBTQ or you're black. You know, I mean, this does not, we know that this isn't Christ-like. Each of us must have to answer and, and, and grow in virtue and account every day doing an examination of conscience. And what this does is to your point, it, it lacks, it flies in the face of all accountability for our individual sin. And, and it casts upon the whole group, the collective uh, guilt. And so therefore, if I'm not accountable for my sin and the group is, 
then I don't have to atone for anything. It's the group's fault. It's terrible. It's so sinister. Right. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, uh, yeah, it's the fault of the group or because I belong to a certain group, I'm either being unjustly advantaged or unjustly disadvantaged and there's no getting around it. That's why it has this element. So that's a kind of you know, philosophical term, hard determinism that, that the, the societal institutions, the family setting are all geared to advantage white uh, over and against people of color and therefore outcomes, um, uh, you're going to get disparate outcomes because of the system. So everything's already determined. It's already determined. The, the, the die has already been cast in your favor or against you, depending on which group you belong to based on race under critical race theory. And that's why it's, it's racist, right? It's treating people based on race. And it comes up frequently. It's worth mentioning here, though. I, I think we all value highly and appreciate, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King's contribution to the civil rights movement and his unforgettable um, uh, uh, statement about how we ought to, we, he wanted his children, I think we all feel this way, people of goodwill, to be judged on the content of character, not the color of their skin. I also would recommend that people, and so it's not lost, go read his letter from Birmingham jail. And you will see a, remember, Dr. Martin Luther King was a reverend, and his PhD was in systematic theology. He made an explicit Christian case for the dignity of every human person in a letter from Birmingham jail. And there's actually a really good kind of like dramatization of it on YouTube that I would highly recommend as well. But that would serve as a, as a good reminder. Also, let's remember that CRT ascribes uh, pers uh, ascribes personal guilt for others' actions and choices. So it tries to say, think uh, historical wrongs in the past are somehow transmitted to the current group or harms are transmitted to the group. Now there can be legacy things of, of groups being advantage, but, but notice how, again, going back to the Joshua Mitchell uh, example, a question they brought up, which is, you know, well, if I'm, it, my ancestors, for example, so I, I identify my race as white, but if I, as I understand when my ancestors uh, came, they came generally from Ireland that we're also really impressed with everybody. And they came here for freedom. But I don't believe I have, I come from a lineage that we ever owned any slaves or participated in any way, shape or form of slavery. And I have some reason to believe that actually some of my ancestors, at least one, fought on the side of the union during the civil war. So it's hard to see how uh, myself or say even my children are personally responsible for the harms of, of slavery as they may continue through to today. But, but that's what CRT is going to say though. My denial of that is, my, is the problem I'm, I'm suffering from. Um, and that's why it's highly divisive because we generally believe in the tenets of a liberal democratic society, um, liberal not in the uh, political sense of being um, uh, progressive or say uh, uh, aligned ideologically with the Democrat party, but liberal in the sense of uh, that there's a, a sort of uh, plurality uh, and tenets of founded on things like uh, rationality, um, impartiality of law and order, et cetera, which are generally compatible with Catholicism. Generally, I would argue there's some dispute to that, but remember for Catholics, it's, we're not, uh, we ought not to, uh, we, ought, we ought to remind ourselves, we are not confined to reason. We have reason and faith, and they go hand in hand. And that is uh, St. John Paul the Great, one of his great encyclicals, Fetus et Ratio, faith and reason. It's, again, something great, that faith and reason are the wings of which the human spirit ascends to God. Faith acts as a kind of corrective to where, as uh, St. John Henry uh, Cardinal Newman uh, talks about how reason can go off the rails. There's all kinds of philosophers out there and philosophies that are uh, simply wrong, wrong-headed, I would say, faith is going to correct it. So if I, if I use my reason and I decide, and I come to the conclusion, for example, that uh, children in the womb ought to be uh, killed at the, at the whim of, uh, or desire or choice of the mother, and it ought to be funded by taxpayer dollars, there ought to be uh, institutional killing centers called Planned Parenthood and the like, I've gone horribly wrong. And I know that I've gone horribly wrong in my reasoning because I can look at divine revelation and the teachings of Holy Mother Church on faith and morals, and that serves as a kind of corrective so I don't go off the rails. And I have to have the intellectual humility to say when I'm wrong, to, rec to, to hear when I'm wrong and change and convert. And that's what this is. There is no conversion or progress to be made for the person under CRT. You're an oppressor or you're the oppressed. So this intersectionality does open a door. Uh, we talked about the Bostock decision. Why? Well, now that Title VII can be seen as extending to sexual orientation protections, for sexual orientation, gender identity, this is going to open up the door to more litigation around things like who can use a bathroom and which bathroom do you get to use? Um, men who identify as women playing in women's sports, which are generally is a, a gigantic unfair advantage. Um, uh, here's an example of how since the Bostock decision, there's multiple lawsuits working their way through the lower courts. Here's an example um, uh, from uh, Timon Klein whose work I've used uh, uh, here throughout this presentation as well. Really, really um, 
uh, prescient on this topic. Uh, the summer heat had not relented before the legacy of Bostock began to play out. Giselle Donnelly wrote at the time in the American Interest, that's a publication, uh, progressives are chomping at the bit to bring new cases, uh, textualism in the service of intersectionality. Barely a month after Gorsuch uh, Inc. had dried, and here's the name of the new suit, it's uh, Frappy versus Affinity Gaming Blackhawk, which is a casino, uh, which became the first federal appellate court to acknowledge sex plus age Title VII claims and relied heavily on Bostock to do so. Here's why that's important. Title VII doesn't include, in its language, doesn't include age. It has a protection for sex, but not age. But Frappy, who brought this suit against the casino, was, uh, uh, the workers were both female and above 40. So notice how this was able to advance. And the, prior to this, it had been challenged many times, Title VII many times over the last 40 years, and always defeated on any expansion because the language wasn't there. Now with Bostock and intersectionality, if you discriminate, uh, discriminate against me because of my sex, it automatically then includes other categories that I belong to, other groups that I belong to. Well, that's a Pandora's box and throws open wide litigation. So um, more to come on that, but that, that is something that we're gonna see a lot more of probably later this year and into next year uh, wow. and maybe beyond. So let's talk about some active resistance and we can uh, kind of wrap this up for today. Um, this sounds a little strong, but really don't give an inch. We found in other cultural uh, battles that when we lose ground, it's, it's exponentially harder to reclaim it. Um, we, where we have lost ground, we need to get more assertive. I uh, very much admire Cup and Cup supporters. I know you, Vicki, uh, and others have been at the forefront in, in the local school systems, and um, that, that is critical. It's very, very hard for uh, the average person out there, you or I, to, to affect change on a national level. So start in your local communities. This is permeating, making its way into our education systems. That's highly problematic. Um, so we need to resist uh, there. Forge an alliance with like-minded people. This, is, this transcends politics. Everything doesn't be fun. This has to, be, has to do with truth and falsity. And so we have truth claims that um, can work as a foil against CRT. Uh, we need to activate parents with information about CRT uh, and its harms to children in our, count, uh, in our country. Children do not need to be taught that they're uh, born into either a status of uh, guilt and racism or uh, that they're, fo they're, they're foisting on others or that they're the re recipients or targets based on their race of uh, unjust discrimination. No, we should be fighting for um, and promoting that this is the land of the free and opportunity is what we offer that people through hard work, developing their talents can and do get ahead. And there's plenty of examples of that. Uh, local is better, so stay active. It's, it's in our local communities that we have the, the best opportunity to make a difference. We need to demand that school boards and administrators reject CRT and its ideological premises of racism, division, Marxist collectivism, um, and false history of America. We absolutely have to do that. Um, and there is some, there have been moves to, to uh, outlaw or ban the teaching in some states, it's not in Indiana just yet, critical race theory. Um, I kind of, um, I'm of mixed views on that at this time. And here's why. There is, a, there is a bit of history of when you try to ban a, a certain kind of ideology using terms like critical race theory, you, you, you can often cause them to sort of be a chameleon and they'll simply sort of uh, change the packaging and maybe you get the same bad ideas but repackaged under a different title that isn't covered by the law. So it's not a law is the best, the best, best approach. It may be, uh, again, I'm, I'm kind of undecided at this point. What I am advocating for, would argue for is we ought to reject it by, a way to reject it is by building awareness around helping people realize why it's such a problem and they reject it on their own. Uh, they come to the truth of things and reject it on their own based on the fact that it's a, if they, it's a horrible, if they, uh, horrible it contains a horrible set of tenets um, that are antithetical to both our country, but also our holy Catholic faith. And then um, elect people into, say, our local school boards, again, local levels that, that are also like-minded and have them, people who are in positions of authority and decision-making that are like-minded. I think that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an approach I certainly advocate at this time. Excellent. We want, to, we want some transparency too. You mentioned earlier, Vicki, about a bit of subterfuge of, you know, teachers or administrations at certain schools, you know, um, having children engage in activities and then being told to keep those secret. That's, that's a very, very big problem that ought not to be happening. We ought to demand, require the curricula, including all the materials. Hey, we have technology. Put it on the internet, put it on the website. Let us look at it and let us weigh in as citizens, as parents, as stakeholders, as interested parties. 
even if I don't, so for example, my children are grown, even if I don't have kids, uh, children that are in, say, the elementary school system, I live in a community in which I have, a, I have an interest that, um, you know, these become our neighbors, children are our future. And so I have an interest that they receive a really good education. I'm happy to uh, pay taxes that provide for a, a great school system, that pay for a great uh, uh, law enforcement, police departments, on and on and on. And I want to do my part. So I, so I am a stakeholder, even if I don't have to. And I, I think that pertains to all of us. We all have an interest in uh, building up the next generation to be thoughtful, responsible, caring um, uh, and, uh, individuals. Now, we also want to dramatically increase the cost of implementing these types of programs through legal and democratic means. In other words, we may have to bring lawsuits if critical race theory is advancing and, um, and, and as a form of opposition and, and, and make them pay a, uh, a penalty uh, using legal peaceful means in order to do so. Um, it's, it was termed, I, I wanna say James Lindsay, I may be wrong there, but a kind of legal warfare, right? We have the court system, we have legislation, we have a democracy, we ought to take advantage of that. CRT violates, again, kind of the, I think the equal protection clause because yeah. it's, it's, it's founded on racism, it sees racism, it divides us based on racism. It can, be a, it can translate to a form of work, workplace harassment. There's all kinds of stories out there, firsthand stories about uh, uh, employees being forced to attend, um, uh, often under the banner of uh, diversity uh, and inclusion and belonging and equity, these kind of uh, indoctrination of being separated based on your, um, maybe your sex or based on your uh, race and then, and then being given these uh, really uh, horrible messages. Um, so, there, so I think there's some, some firm legal ground in which we can push back. Yeah, well, I, I, Montana came out, it was wonderful with their legal opinion, saying it violated the Amendment 14 to the Constitution just last week, which is very encouraging. That's excellent. Uh, there are a couple of things uh, to point out that are kind of pending legis legislation and programs that may show up. Um, there's a lot of talk about the Equality Act. Again, won't have time to go into that in any great detail. That critics of that particular um, let piece of legislation warned that it really will um, uh, d greatly diminish um, protections for religious liberty in our country. Maybe lesser known, but certainly worth doing research on. The Civics Secures Democ Democracy Act um, and Action Civics, it's called. Again, this is, a, again, the banner, which I think we all agree with, we would love to see more uh, teaching, more education around civics, what it means to be a citizen and responsible member of our society. Um, but the content, that's what's key. Like, what's under that? Because we all agree on that. That sounds good. But it's what's underneath. That, that's where the, the devil literally is in the details. I think the 1619, um, there's, actually, uh, there's actually been some really good, I've found some really balanced debates um, on the 1619 Project of those who find it highly problematic, those, those who uh, feel that that's an element of our history we have to advance. But we have to, we have to become uh, aware of what's, being, what's going on, what's being taught. One of the problems, or con there's a constraint with education always, which is there's only so much time, right? There's only so much classroom time. Um, there's only so much content you can deliver at any point in an educational system. So we have to make smart choices and we can advocate and influence what those choices are. And then again, after we just looked at that example of Frappy, uh, after the Bostock uh, decision, there is literally a flood of lawsuits in the lower courts that can dramatically expand on uh, intersectionality. And that has tremendous um, implications, uh, not just for Catholic institutions, but Catholic institutions should be uh, quite worried about um, that kind of legislation. Um, because again, you're, you're going to have multiple categories um, that will now be included when, um, in terms of uh, this litigation and how that might be resolved. Yeah couple of slides. People can pause the video so they can write them down if they want. But uh, here, these are all the resources um, uh, there was, uh, that I drew from for uh, today's lecture. Um, and they're, they're on both sides of the issue. So there are primary sources listed. For example, um, Kimberly Crenshaw's book is uh, really indispensable, Critical Race Theory. She's really sort of the pioneer in this field. You ought to read it so that you understand critical race theory in their own terms, those who are uh, proponents of it, advancing it. And I, I, try, uh, I hope I've done a, a, a good job trying to put critical race theory at least as, explain it at least as, to be fair, to, to, I oppose it, but to my opponents, um, that they would at least uh, see their own idea being represented fairly, even if I critique it. Um, obviously, we have the catechisms really good. Timon Klein's article on intersectionality is fantastic. Uh, Robin D'Angelo, et cetera, there's a bunch listed here. James Lindsay, again, is, is fantastic. Um, 
on this. And then others, I definitely want to call out Joshua Mitchell, some, and two others I didn't mention, but I really leaned on a lot were Christopher Rufo. Um, his work in this area, his debates are fantastic. I highly recommend looking at those on YouTube. And then, then, then I would say probably it's, it's related to this topic, but um, not the primary focus. But I would say probably the most indispensable book that I've read over the last decade is this last one listed. Carl Truman's book called mm -hmm. The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self um, is just, it's now a bestseller on Amazon. It really should be. But uh, that is, that explains a lot. He's, he's primarily, uh, that book is really focused on this emergence of transgender ideology and how we got there kind of from a, uh, you know, kind of a philosophical, like how did these ideas emerge and build over uh, a long period of time, several centuries. And uh, it's just indispensable because it, it describes features in our current setting, Vicki, that I, we might, you might be puzzled about. I was puzzled about like, why is this, why is it possible? His, his main question is trying to answer, how is it possible uh, for it to be true to say, I'm a man trapped in a woman's body or I'm a woman trapped in a man's body? What, what makes that what would make that true or someone to believe that about themselves or to affirm that in others. And so that, that uh, his tracing that out is super helpful. And with that, I know I've said a lot. <laughs> Thank you again for the time. And um, oh, this I'll has been fabulous. Uh, your chance to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ask any yeah. questions or. Well, I mean, you have been so thorough and what I loved about what you did was it was so well balanced, Tim. And I, I, I love the beginning um, at the origins of critical race theory and the Catholic moral principles, you know, for cup supporters it's important that we act, you know, pray and then act um, because this is permeating every facet of our society. And, and what Timothy outlined in here are just pragmatic steps that we can take and really make an impact. So I encourage you to reach out at your local school levels to find out exactly what's going on. If you find out that they say they're not doing critical race theory, you need to peel the layers of the onion away because it's likely they're doing something called cultural competency and they're using other terms because they don't want the friction. And so I, I highly encourage you to share this video, uh, to like this video, and, um, and I'm sure uh, Tim, uh, Timothy will uh, uh, you know, answer any questions that uh, come my way if you send those to me. So thank you so much, Tim. If you stop sharing for a moment, we'll close in prayer. Okay. All right. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, uh, Heavenly Father, I thank you and I ask you to bless Timothy O'Donnell and uh, all of our cup supporters and our cup leaders and all that are in this, uh, this battle, uh, this cultural battle um, that we're seeing. It's actually a spiritual warfare that's, that's occurring in our society. Uh, Lord Jesus, uh, through your sacred heart, we ask you to give us the courage and the conviction to speak truth and to do it with kindness and love and promote dialogue so that we can bring about your greater glory and eradicate uh, this false doctrine that is permeating our culture. We ask all of these things in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. In the name amen. of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Timothy. Oh, thank you, Vicki. My pleasure. God bless. God bless.